thank you. Um, it's, it's fun to be here. I have uh, had the privilege of speaking in numerous forums over the years, but I haven't actually spoken in Seattle for probably about 20 years, so it's kind of fun to be talking about something um, at home. Uh, when, when uh, as David said, you know, we agreed to do the talk, uh, I immediately told my partner, hey, I'm going to talk at Creative Mornings. And uh, she said, oh, what's the subject? And I said, language. And she said, bad. And I thought, <laughs> ba bad language or bad that the subject is language? And she said, yes. And, um, <laughs> and you can see with that kind of support, um, that's why she's my partner. Anyhow. Um, she could, then she went on to say that, you know, well, you always said you should only talk about things you know about. And um, so I'm going to start out talking about something I know about, which is how language has had a huge impact on my career, because that's really what you want to hear about is my career. Um, anyhow, the, uh, over the years, um, well, I first came into language um, uh, and got, got exposed to it uh, in high school. I, I took French. That was my first real exposure to language. And my French teacher uh, was from Houston, Texas. Uh, Mrs. Evie Matthews. I will never forget her. She was five feet in every direction and just a warm, warm-hearted woman. And uh, so um, I eventually learned that bonjour, like I learned that I could do a good southern accent really well. So, so that was one thing I learned from her. And the other thing I learned besides bonjour, como talez vous, um, was that that is not really a south of France accent. Um, I learned I could not speak French. I could not, I wasn't good at language is what I learned. So that impacted um, the next big move in my life, which was at 18. Um, when you're 18 years old, we ask 18 year olds, say, okay, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Which we do it even today. I think it's a ridiculous thing to ask an 18 year old. Um, I think back on most of the decisions I made when I was 18, and I probably should apologize for almost all of them. Um, and I certainly should regret probably all of them. So anyhow, um, my decision was, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Now, um, there's not enough gray hairs here to know, but this was in the early 1970s. So in the early 1970s, if you were a male, the decision what to do with the rest of your life was pretty easy. You either went to college or you went to Vietnam. Um, and uh, one you had to pay for, and the other one the government paid all your expenses. Um, Vietnam was not the vacation mecca that it is today. Uh, there was a little war thing going on, and, and if you wanted to talk about the rest of your life, Vietnam and the rest of your life was not a long-term proposition. So, um, again, um, I had to make a decision. It was easy. I went to college. Then it was, what, what profession are you going to be? And, again, language played a part, because I had learned from, from Mrs. Matthews that I wasn't that good at language. So uh, much to my mother's dismay, um, evidently being a doctor required language, like Latin, as if anybody. I don't even know if the Vatican still uses it. But um, so that was ruled out. And I thought I might like to be a lawyer. That sounded cool. Um, I had watched Perry Mason. Again, Google it, um, for those of you who don't know. But um, anyhow, I, uh, I thought that would be cool. And they need language, too, tons of it, and foreign language. And it's like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, so I started looking on the list. What could I do that didn't have language in it? And right there, maybe it's an A, you know, it's top of the list, architecture. No language requirement. I'm like, yes, I like to draw. I can do this. So um, I became an, you know, I became an architect. I uh, had one language requirement. I think it was like composition 120 or something. I think I got four years. I can do that. I can get through it. And I did and, and became an architect. And I thought, I am done with language. I, I'm not a student of language, which was also a dumb thing to say because I realized um, 40 years later um, that language was something I studied intently from there on and started integrating more and more into our work. Um, now, obviously, language, you know, we use it every day in just general communication, but uh, there's a whole complexity to the language as, as to how it can drive creative ideas. Um, and, and I should tell you, I guess, a little bit about um, uh, what, what we do. Um, let's see if I hit a button. Yeah, okay. Um, I have a company called Five Creative. And what we do is, is we help um, our clients make more money. And, and we're good at that, and they like that. They, they find that to be a positive thing. Um, the way we do it, we don't do it in that sort of Gordon Gecko kind of way, where you know, you and Wall Street and you know, bonds and weird stuff and inflated prices. What we do is we help our clients 
uh, strengthen the bond they have with their customers. Uh, so, so we make and work on an emotional level uh, in many ways uh, with, with our clients so that their customers like them. Because if you have an emotional bond with your customer, um, they'll buy more from you. Uh, and, and it's just, it's proven time and time again. Um, I could give you an example. Um, how many people here have an iPhone? Okay, if, no, keep your hands up for a minute. If you have an iPhone, keep your hands up. Now, if you are not aware that there is a less expensive smartphone out there, keep your hand up. Yeah. So, um, there are less expensive phones, and they do everything. They take pictures, they take movies, they do email, they do, you know, pretty much whatever you're going to do. Oh, and you can make phone calls, too. I forgot. Yeah. Um, you can do that, too, um, on these phones. But let's face it, the iPhone, if you had your hand up, then you already know this, but the iPhone is the only one that makes you taller, thinner, richer, and just downright better in everything you do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's why you buy it, because there's that emotional that you're sure that it's doing all these things for you. And so that's how we work with, with, with our clients um, in, in trying to do that. And, and when I started out, um, it, it wasn't so much about language, uh, it, was, it was about physical spaces. And, and store design and things of that nature. And over the years, um, language became a bigger part of it. We started to tell stories. And it was like, um, we wouldn't start a project without some sort of a story sheet on the project. And the first big impact that had was um, we were invited to do a store design for the Space Needle at the base of the Space Needle. They had this little triangular building they wanted a store design for. And we said, we don't want to do that. And we got together with some very creative writers. Um, and uh, we were really lucky. We pulled in some people from Almost Live, you know, Bill Nye, the science guy, and this. And we, and we wrote this fabulous story about what it was like um, because of the base of the Space Needle, how cool that building was. And um, we presented that to the owners. And uh, the impact was that they had a $300,000 budget for the base building, and they changed it to an $8.5 million budget for the base building. And it was like, wow. That's the power of words. That, that's like that's a big deal. They got it. They understood that that's what the whole experience was supposed to be about and they went for it. And so ever since that point, that was, I don't know when we did that, that's 20 some years ago. Um, and and um, now that round building at the base of the Space Needle, um, that's the result of that. Uh, so we, we learned and that that had that kind of impact and so every project we do now, there's a story, there's a narrative that goes with it. Uh, we wouldn't start it without it. And um, I want to give you, so, so with that narrative, um, we, we have something we call the brand voice. Uh, that's really what, what um, it often turns into. And, and a brand voice um, is, is, is like, it's part of the brand package, right? And, and again, a lot of you guys probably deal with this all the time, so if I'm repeating stuff you know, I apologize, but for those that might see it as a different perspective, what it has to do with is when you got a brand, they say, here's your color. Okay, it's PMS 485, great, great red, love it, okay. And then here's your logo. Oh, by the way, don't put anything this close to it, don't put it above it, don't do this, don't do that, just keep it that way, okay, great. Those are easy to maintain. Brand voice is a little different, because brand voice is about what you say. So what you say to um, you know, your customers, uh, pretty, pretty important. Um, almost as important as how you say it. Because he's an idiot, right? No problem. Um, you're walking down that same street and some car comes skidding up and almost hits you and you yell, you're an idiot. It's a different vibe. Um, same, same exact words, but it's a different vibe. Uh, another example of that might be when we talk about, um, like, um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you. That, that's, that's one way of saying it. I'm thrilled to be here to talk with you. That's a whole nother vibe, because now we're having a conversation as opposed to me lecturing. So again, how you say it, key. And then another key on that is that, um, Make sure that it has a point of view. If you say the same thing that everybody else is saying, I promise you no one will be listening. Um, you need a point of view. You need to say it in a way that's just a little bit different. Um, and, and it's amazing. I'm, I'm sure, again, you guys see it all the time, but we, we work with clients and 
uh, we ask them, you know, well, what do you do? And they tell us, and how are you different? And they may not even be able to say it. And you're just sitting there going, no wonder. Nobody wants to work with you. Nobody wants to buy this product. You're not interesting. And again, um, we need to make it, make it interesting. Um, this was an architectural You know, and again, it doesn't mean that it's a slogan, it doesn't mean that it's a tagline, it doesn't mean that it's all of that, although it may be, uh, but, but less is very impactful. Um, you know, Nike kind of nailed that one with just do it. Really impactful. Um, I like cartoons, so this is just for me, but... Um, I So I didn't rebrand Killer Whale. Um, I actually didn't uh, rebrand these companies either, but I thought they were good examples. So Um, no matter which car, if we, if, if we all got one of these cars and we left here at exactly the same time and drove to Portland, nobody has an advantage. We're all going to get there about the same time. Um, just depends what kind of bad traffic you get into around, you know, the Air Force Base and, you know, in Tacoma and what have you. So there's, you know, in a broad spectrum, there's absolutely no difference between what these cars offer you. Um, but if we look at their brand voice a little bit, and, and look at it, the, the persona for, for BMW is just that it's so darn intelligent. It's so well engineered that, um, and you're smart, obviously, or you, you know, you're so smart, you know that this is the car you want. It's absolutely the best choice. Now, how do they bring that out in the public? Very little writing on this, you probably can't read it, but up in the left-hand corner, it says, cost, $39,460. And then underneath it says, feels like $1 million says, you save $946,000, uh, $530, or whatever the math works out. Um, but so, you know, it's like, you're so smart here. Let's help you. We take price out of the equation. By the way, you notice the car is going really fast because everything's a blur about the car. Um, and the car is coming at you. I know that's kind of not language that's more visual, but it's still part of the whole thing. And it's important to note, um, as you'll see as we go through this. Um, so that's, that's BMW. Um, a little bit more traditional ad for BMW, uh, the body of a coupe with the uh, sole of a race car, and, and you know, feel the exhilaration. It's like, oh yeah, I gotta get there. Um, oh, and I should mention otherwise too. Part of the whole thing is the precision in that. That's why that, that math, like they could have just rounded out the math on the other ad and said, you know, eh, it's $40,000 or it's, you know, $49,000, but no, we're gonna take it down. is everything to them, right? The whole name, it's Mini. Um, but they don't forget that when they start doing their copy. Uh, when they start writing ads for it, they stay really slight, really tight, right? So today's weather report, whatever. Um, it's a convertible, it's great, you're prepared for anything. The other things to notice here now, their tagline, be Mini, okay? Be Mini. It's not buy Mini, it's not get Mini, it's not, it's be Mini, right? So it's a whole lifestyle. This is, it's, and it's not, it's not um, exclusive like a club. It's just a lifestyle that we want to be part of. So be many. Oh, you'll notice also the car's not really moving anywhere fast. Whoops, did I go the wrong way here? Um, I'm clicking buttons. Okay. Um, this one I loved. Just plenty of room. Uh, good, good, you know, play on words, um, talking about language. But um, the car stopped. You can walk up and hug it. This is, there's no, 
there's no blur. There's no, it's just right there. It's just cute. It's small, it's, but it's got plenty of room. Um, and be many. So, so that's their attitude and how they, their voice brings that about. Porsche. I love Porsche. Just, um, like I said, I, I had done some work with them and it was, um, every, every joke, you know, you know about Porsche. It's true. And they, and they're the ones telling them. Um, so, you know, like if you haven't heard the Porsche jokes, like what's the difference between a Porsche and a porcupine? Does everybody know that one? The guys are nodding. The guys know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the pricks are on, on the porcupine. The pricks are on the outside. So, um, <laughs> that's that's the difference between between them. Um, and and Porsche gets it. Uh, again, um, th those are jokes that the, their marketing VP told. Um, so you know they they know that and they embrace that. There there is a whole lot of attitude in that company and they embrace it. So you know they're witty. They're flippant. And we, they're smart. Like like BMW, except they're smart ass. They're like they're just cool. And whereas Mini's a lifestyle, Porsche is more like a club. Like you you know you got to get invited to get into it. And there is such a thing as the Porsche Club of America and so forth. So you know it is a club. Um, and their attitude kills bugs fast. I thought that's really just wraps up their whole attitude. It doesn't say anything really about the driving experience and everything else. It just you know. It's just, we kill bugs fast. Mini doesn't kill bugs. Mini, ju they just fly around and it's sweet and everybody's happy. But Porsche, it's like, no, we're just driving right through. Get out of my way. Um, and, and matter of fact, you know, this one, uh, my other car is, um, I forget. Uh, of course you do because it's irrelevant. It's not a Porsche. Um, so we got all kinds of attitude. And you'll notice, if, if you're paying attention now, Porsche's back to moving again. But do you notice that Porsche, we're looking at the butt? Porsche's going by. Por Actually, in Porsche, if you ever drew one, the rearview mirrors are relatively small. They don't really care what's behind them. They're just they're going forward. That's that's all that they're, they're into. So um, it's 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 a great car, um, a lot of fun to drive, but a very different attitude and very different brand voice. And that's how they strengthen that brand so that the right person has the uh, emotional connection to them. So so those were three examples of of using voice um, that we had nothing to do with. Uh, and now I'll just give you three examples of of using voice that we did have. Uh, some stuff to do with. Um, the, the brands you, you may know them may not. Marmot is a um, clothing, uh, outdoor clothing company uh, based out of San Francisco. Uh, great stuff. Uh, EMI is a local company here in Seattle uh, that does uh, consumer research um, for energy companies. I can't think of a more boring topic and they love it. Um, so, you know, that's why we're all doing what we're doing. Uh, but th they were trying to convey the fact that they loved it. And then Sea Alaska Heritage. Um, you, Sea Alaska is a organization or a company that was founded um, sort of by the government back numerous years ago. Uh, consists of, of three um, Indian clans or tribes uh, from southeast Alaska. And uh, government years ago gave, gave big sections of Alaska back to the native people. And uh, they formed corporations and there's about seven of them in Alaska. Sea Alaska is the southeast Alaskan uh, corporation. And um, uh, the Sea Alaska Heritage is um, an arm of that company that is, is geared totally to sort of preserving um, and promoting uh, their way of life and their lifestyle and their heritage. And uh, again, so we've got something that's uh, one that's fashion. We've got one here that, that's, that's technical um, and, and, and one that's as about emotional as you can get um, when you're talking about, you know, your, your, your race and your heritage. So. Um, Brand voice played a role in each of those. We did different things for um, each of those. Uh, so um, with Marmot, um, it just may be uh, the best made, best tested, and most trusted gar outdoor garment. Um, it's really good stuff. Uh, and they're very creative. And uh, they make it really well. Uh, and they do one other thing that uh, they feel they do better than, than um, anyone else, and that is add fashion to it. So not only do you not freeze to death on the mountain, you actually look good when you're not freezing to death on the mountain or when you're, you know, in the ski lodge in, you know, Vail. Um, so, so how do you express that? How did, how did they talk about that? Uh, they've got uh, innovation down cold. Uh, so, so this was a store display uh, where we looked at the, uh, their, their heritage with their old jacket versus their new jacket and just talked about all the benefits of the new jacket. Um, and again, the headline, we've got innovation down cold. 
uh, game-changing design since 1971. Um, sets up their heritage uh, and, and makes a statement. There's a little clever to it. Uh, Marmot is, is a little bit of fashion Porsche, if you will. There's a, there's a little bit of attitude that goes into that, uh, hoping you're smart enough to get it. Um, another in-store display uh, was a uh, Marmot for life. Um, that's, their, uh, that's their guarantee. And so if anything goes wrong with your jacket, they fix it, and they will fix it like new. Uh, and if for some bizarre reason they can't, then they will uh, just give you a new one. But um, the wording on this one, I thought, again, from a language standpoint, um, was pretty smart. It's before, after, and the after, the sleeve has a tear in it, if you'll notice, and that's after skier hits tree, um, parentheses there, and then after, after. So um, it's not just a before and after, there's a before and after and an after, after. We, um, we have a, a term we use a lot, which is called arm around you copy. And, and often um, corporations will, in their websites or anywhere, they tell you all about themselves and it's all about them. And, and if it goes on too long, it's a really bad date. Um, you know, anytime you go out with someone and all they do is talk about themselves, they never ask you a question, you know, it's a bad party, a bad date, whatever. Corporations do that a lot and they never embrace their customers. So we work with a lot of that in trying to embrace the customer. Um, so here, it doesn't just say we see life differently. It doesn't just say you see life differently. It says let's bond together here. Like you, we see life differently. So our view of a dinner jacket is the same as your view of a dinner jacket. There's a smile in there. There's a connection there. Um, you know, their, their view of a mobile home, you know, it's the same as your view of a mobile home. Um, you get in on the joke. Um, when we were doing part of their, their um, trying to establish their, their brand, um, from a historical point of view, we learned an interesting fact that um, their, the, the founders wanted to test their garments and they couldn't afford to go out on the mountain, so they found a, a butcher shop that would let them uh, spend seven days in a meat locker in the back of the room. And it's like, no, you're not serious. And they're like, yeah, that's how they did it. And it's like, perfect. So, you know, we uh, added the fact that Hillary spent seven days climbing Everest and our founder spent seven days in the meat locker. Um, that sets the tone. Again, there's a little bit of humor, but you start, to, you start to know who these people are. And the more you know about them, the more you're likely to, to buy from them. You get it. You understand the difference. It's not just a whole bunch of slick advertising. There's something real there. And I think that's another very important fact in, in voice is that it's got to be real. If you're just making it up, we, we have, we have uh, done numerous uh, branding exercises with companies and they say, well, we need you to give us a brand. And it's like, no, we don't do that. Um, we don't give you a brand. You already have a brand. We may perfect it. We may, you know, we may nudge it here and there and, and try and do it. But mostly we just want to express it. All we're trying to do is express who you really are in a way that relates with who you say your customer is. So that's, that's the goal. Um, if, if you come in and say, we'll give you a brand, um, that's sort of like an Oprah makeover. You know, if, if, remember when Oprah was on TV, again, Google it. Um, when Oprah was on TV and people would go on, on stage and they'd come out an hour later and they'd be gorgeous and fabulous and everybody loved them. And then if you ever see them three days later, they don't even look like the person that was on Oprah. They're back to their own ways because that wasn't who they were. Their brand is their brand. Um, so it's really important that it's real. Um, okay, the... Uh, uh, EMI, um, again, when I talked about them, they're, they're really passionate about what they do, but it's numbers. So they're passionate about numbers, and they wanted to get that put out in a way that was compelling, intriguing, and, and part of the thing was to, to recruit people. Um, so so um, on their website, um, we, we found a way to make numbers tell the story. Uh, you know, 26 essential services, hundreds of smart ideas, you know, one call to get you the information you need. That's, that's the way to set that up. That was their voice. And we were able to carry that through all the way. So even on um, people pages, you know, it's like, you know, one degree in this and then two growing kids and, you know, 200 plus client engagements and, and 14 countries visited and so forth and so on, that that number in that grid form was a way to make it visible as to how the people interacted um, with one another and how their work was reflected in everything they did. Um, even in, when we did, um, you know, announcements and, and, and things of that nature, uh, the, same, the same vocabulary uh, carries through. Last example um, is Sea Alaska, and I told you a little bit about them. They're all about heritage forward. Uh, that, was, that was their big thing, and, and just to jump right at it, um, what we did was we looked at what they did, and we said, how can we say something about it that's both 
uh, heritage, uh, looking back and remembering that, because that's they've got 9,000 years of heritage. That's important to them, but they're not done. Uh, they're as interested in the next 9,000 years as they were in the last 9,000 years. So. Um, uh, Elizabeth Petrovovich, um, she was an activist fighting for um, uh, Indian rights so that Indians could go into any building in, in, in the city, in Juneau and things of that nature. Um, that's an Indian warrior. So that's what we said, this is an Indian warrior. Um, you see the basket there. Uh, the basket, the weaves are so intricate and, and so detailed, the teachers use those to teach math to students. So that's why this is, this is a calculator. And so we found that if we just use different ways to frame things, change what your expectation is um, by, the, by the verbiage. On the left there, they have a, uh, an event they call celebration. It happens every two years where people come from all around um, and show off the, the tribe's regalia. Um, so we said this is fashion week. Um, that's a different way to look at it. That's again updating everything that they do and making it current and, and valid for today as well as um, when, it was, when it was new technology, you know, maybe 3,000 years ago. So um, as a bit of a wrap up, um, when, when we're working with, with, with our, our uh, vocabulary, um, we have the saying that voice is word logo. It's a lot harder to get it to be consistent. You got a lot more forums out there. Um, you know, you can have 20 employees and, and you, in the old days, one person was in charge of, you know, sort of putting stuff out there. Now everybody puts stuff out there. So it's a little trickier, but it is really impactful and it really makes a difference. And especially on that emotional level that, that other, other design elements may not carry. So you want to have a point of view uh, with your word logo. You want to keep it consistent. You want to keep it short and answer questions. That's a note to me. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I think that that's one of the fun things. I said my partner. So now, I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's from a language standpoint earlier. That's a very, um, you know, sort of vague term nowadays. It didn't used to be. You say partner and you knew exactly what it was. It was someone you were in business with. Now it could be someone I'm in business with. It could mean I'm gay. Um, it could mean that um, it's just someone I've lived with for 30 years. It could be anything. So. Words, words, the language continues to change, um, I guess is where I'm going. But yeah, on a button on a website, for instance, um, uh, if you say free, um, that, that's usually a good, I'm, I'm kind of clicking there. Um, but if you say more information, you will get more people to click it than if you say free trial. At least that's everything that we found on, on various sites where we've tested that. Um, we actually have a, one client that uh, their product is an editing for language. Um, editing software um, and we do a lot of different testing on that and it's fun but um, more information there's no commitment there okay whereas um, get free trial it's free it's you know no obligation but there's a commitment there the old they're gonna want my email address I'm not going I'm not you know we're just dating I'm not ready to give you that um, so um, language choice is huge um, and and how you say it makes a big difference yeah Yeah, um, I think part of it is any project you start, you, you should have a goal, right? You, you know where you want to get to um, at the end. And so that's the story that we, we start to write. So we, we, we you know, do the time machine, fast forward. Um, what, what's the result we're going to get by doing this work? Um, so we're doing a project now where we're, we're working with a, with a company on their interior of their offices, and it's part about bringing their values and their brand to life in, in their offices. And we've done this in the past, but so part of that project, that story is telling about, maybe it's, um, I was so depressed today when I came to work, I just didn't want to be there. And then when I walked down the hallway and saw the sign reminding me of how many people we have helped last year, I felt much better about what I was doing and I got excited and went forward. And it's those kinds of stories. It's not necessarily saying what, the, what did they see down the hall or what does it look like or what, but it's, 
it's talking about where we're trying to get to, and that starts to frame. So, okay, we need something that addresses that. So, uh, again, maybe it's you know part of it's just playwriting, but part of it's taking it just from a goal statement, make people feel good, to trying to make it more human, so that we can all relate to it a little better. Does that answer? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Huh. Probably, um, but it probably isn't selling as well as it could or would. Um, I can't put my I can't put my fingers on it. You know, um, there there um, and, and and voices change and all of that. But um, I'm trying to think like like now I can't come up with one that because I think by the time you know it, um, there is a voice out there associated with it. Uh, so there may be some little ones that that you know nobody's ever heard of that that we know of, but um, you can do yeah you can do business. So Dan, bigger scope, you can do business and be really bad at it and still you know survive and make a living. Um, it's it's and and you know our company we don't work with a lot of startups and we don't work with a lot of really big corporations anymore. We kind of work with emerging corporations, so that it's it's more about we're doing this and we'd like to do it a whole lot better. We know we're not doing this as well as we could, and, and we'd like to take it to that next level. And, and so that's sort of a little bit of um, our sweet spot. So, you know, yeah, e EMI, they had a horrible voice. Um, now they don't. Uh, so, you know, yeah. Well, um, first of all, I have to say that I was probably a really lousy architect. Um, I, uh, I, I learned so much when I got into the actual profession, out of school and in the, in the profession and working and, and drawing buildings and, and doing all of that. And, and I, I realized that, that architecture was, part of the whole importance of language in architecture is to convince people to build what you're, what you're doing. Um, and and uh, the guy with the loudest voice and the biggest words usually won the argument. Uh, that usually wasn't me. Fortunately, I stumbled into and started designing stores. And then the argument of whether it was good or not was settled by the customer because if the cash register rang, it was a really good design. Um, and that also meant that if you're going to do good retail design, you end up having graphics which have messaging um, and you have merchandising and how you put things together. Um, so all of that kind of, kind of started, started going. And I look at things, I, I worked for um, MBBJ for 15 years, um, started their retail division and it was, um, that was big A. And I was the weirdo in the firm. I looked at everything differently than they did um, because I was constantly looking at it from the end user. That's, that's my whole concern is the customer. Um, and I don't know how many architects I will insult here, but having you know been in the profession long enough, it won't be the first time. But architects have a tendency to be really concerned about other architects. They want to know how it's going to look in the design publication. That's who they're, that's who they're talking to. That's who they get excited by. Um, you know, when you look at the process for the architecture in the library here in town, you know, fabulous building, but it was all architects talking to architects. Um, it wasn't like, okay, you know, how's, how's that, how's that help me find my book? I mean, just again, maybe, maybe a dumb example, but, um, so I look at things differently than the typical architect looks at things and my concern is always the end user. And if you look at spaces, you, you start to say, okay, how will this make someone feel? How will this, where will, where will someone want to go? You know, you, you know, like human behavior, we go to the right. Um, even in England, we go to the right. I haven't figured that one out yet, where they drive on the left. But, but there are certain things that happen. So again, um, you know, you can only pull someone about 50 feet. Uh, and by that, I mean, if you put something out there, a visual, a sign or something, and it's more than 50 feet away when they're walking, they, they don't really notice it and they won't really go towards it. Um, unless you change the scales to be huge, thus billboards and things of that nature. But anyhow, so there's all those kinds of things that, that, um, that come into play that are architectural elements that, that we use to get people to, to move and behave in a certain way. But again, I'm not sure if I just went on a, my own little vo voyage there. Did I answer your question or even come close? <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a no. All right, uh, yeah. <laughs> We, we originally did it for us. 
Um, a lot of the documents that we write, we don't share with the client. Um, it is for us. We may come back when we're talking to the client, we may come back and explain that part of the reason we did this is because of this, that, or the other thing. But yeah, the, the, actually the narrative is, is an internal document. Um, it just gives it more life and it makes it more real. The way we write it makes it more real than if I just list goals, right? If, if the goal is, you know, okay, increase sales, you know, increase dwell time, um, you know, do whatever, that's kind of boring. If I, if, I, if I start to wrap around it and start to get into a little bit of the how we're going to do that or the why we're going to do that, uh, that might lead to the how and, and things of that nature. So it, I, I don't know how anymore to do a project without writing out a story about that project. Um, I, 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 again, I, it's hard to, you know, I could read you stuff and I don't know that it would be very entertaining or exciting, but we, like I say, we start every time with a story. It is a story and then we start to illustrate the story. So it, it, to us, it is a creative doc. Yeah. Well, it's a good point because a lot of times, um, especially on the brand, that you have to know how, how people, especially in naming, when we do any naming exercises, which we do, which I sort of left off the list today, um, but how people are going to bastardize that name. You, you really have to look at that. Um, you know, it's just because they're going to. Um, you know, and there's some you can't avoid. Um, you know, uh, but, but you, you want to at least consider it when you're putting it out there to say, is it really going to be bad and is it really going to be damaging? Uh, again, most of our stuff is is dealt with. I, I think maybe we're just yeah, we're stupid. Um, but we're we're, uh, we're most of our stuff is on the positive. Try and highlight the positive. We don't do damage control. Um, we will, you know, sometimes if we've gotten reached to by clients, um, for instance, the name may just be a bad name, um, or they may have done something that they want to move away from. Uh, they've probably moved away from it and stabilized it before they talk to us. Um, we worked with a client and then their name was Bellevue Financial. Um, great company, great people, um, but they were trying to compete on a more national scale and Bellevue didn't mean anything to anybody um, on the west coast, uh, anywhere in the middle of the country and on the east coast Bellevue meant a crazy hospital in New York City. So you want to have your crazy hospital in New York City financial company. Um, so again, that's, that's sort of a negative and we moved them away from that name. Yeah. The, the um, well, in, in a way, it probably is appropriate. Um, uh, we'll have a couple of two confessions. I'll have two or three here real quick because um, I don't want to take up too much time. But, um, okay, true confession one, I own a Porsche, okay? Um, and and, and like, one of the amazing things about it is, you know, because every guy my age ends up doing something stupid, right? So mine was the car. Um, I, I, I told uh, the guy I was getting a uh, client, I was buying the car, and he goes, oh, yeah, he goes, you don't have enough money for a girlfriend, you know? So. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the thing, you either buy the sports car or you, you get the girlfriend when you get to be my age. Um, I got the sports car and I will tell you that um, there's, there's somewhere out there there's this preconception about, you know, like it'll, it's like it'll attract chicks. No, it attracts 58 year old men. <laughs> you would not believe the guys that will walk up to me on the street and just go, cool car. And, and then they say, so, you know, what kind of engine does it have? And it's like, I don't know. Um, what's the horsepower? Is it like, you know, 380? It's like, yeah, that's what it is. I have no idea. I just like driving it. It's fun to drive. Um, but anyhow, so, um, when, so it, their market is guys. You will see women who drive it, who love the drive. And, and again, it has, as a car, it's a great car. But the, their market is men. Um, now, what was really interesting and surprising, um, again, German, very German. When I worked with them, it was a few years ago. Um, and they were um, very German, uh, very male, the, the whole, except um, uh, the uh, one of the, the second in, in command of, I don't know the exact title, of marketing was a woman who came across looking like a 
what you would expect of a German Porsche driver. She was very hard, she was very German, um, but she was very, very female. And so they ha they're aware, I think, um, and they're making a conscious effort. So, um, you know, again, whether it's right or wrong, it probably is effective for their market and their sales. Yeah. Yeah. One, one, of the, one of the toughest things to do, we work with a couple of uh, very brilliant writers, and, but one of the toughest things to do is to take it out of the writers and give it to the company. Because, um, that, and that's, a, that's a, a training and a transition thing, and, and the really good companies that we've worked with spend a lot of time going back and forth, hey, hey we're going to put this out, do we have it right? And, and they, but it's learning. So it, it's learning how to say something. It's learning what are key words for you and, and training. Because it, like I said, PMS number, you know, you nailed it, right? You, you're done, you, you move on. Here you give them a great voice and you talk about, you know, always, you know, be many, you know, that's your, always be this and let's do this. And then they go out there and they say, you should do blah, blah. And you're going like, you know, okay, you just killed it, guys. Um, so again, uh, it's just, it, the, the clients hopefully understand that it takes some time. They hopefully budget some money so that you're, you're partnering with them and, and training and, and basically weaning them onto it until it becomes their own language. And it does over time. They just, it's their language. So then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, we do, and, and usually we get fired. Um, sometimes, every once in a while we quit, um, and sometimes you just go, okay, what do you want? And let's just get this over with, and let's just go, and we won't be working long term. Uh, you know, we have clients that some of them are eight, ten years have been our clients, and, and we're really thrilled with that, but some of them, it's just a bad marriage, you know. Um, and the best thing you do is you figure out the best way to get out of it without hurting anybody. Um, I, I had one time where, where half the team quit and I had to finish it up and that was just ugly because they, and they were right to quit, but that wasn't what we said we'd do to the client. So, you know, there's part of that that just says, no, you said you'd get them there and it's just a matter of, let, you let them drive. And, and, you know, the term for that is, that's, um, you know, that's like buying the dog and then doing the barking yourself. Like, why did you hire us? And now you're telling us how to do this. That, that doesn't make any sense, but people do that. Oh, I forgot my other Porsche confession. Um, so so um, the, one of the first things I did for Porsche was the design of their corporate offices. Um, and that was just right place at right time. I was so not qualified. But hey, I did it. Um, and they turned out fabulous. But during the, during the presentation of the, of the design, there we are, the board meeting. We're, we're in Nevada. And this is, this is, you know, I'm a kid. And this is really exciting. And, and um, and, and I'm presenting this, and, and it's just a fabulous design, and really excited, and the CEO says, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, let me ask my secretary about the color, because I'm not sure about the color. And we were like, are you kidding me? And, and not to, you know, be a fashion snob, but this was a woman in a lime green pantsuit. It was a while ago, but in a lime green pantsuit that had little owl sculptures on her desk. And we're like, no, this, this isn't happening to me, right? This, like, you know, this is... And anyhow, so um, you know, there they were allowing some female interaction as to what the what the brand should be. Um, anyhow, um, yeah, sometimes it's not a perfect fit. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Uh, usually, it has to do with sales. Um, and, and again, like like um, it. it Everyone's different. If it has to do with a website, it, it's about you know time that either either pages visited, time on the pages, um, conversions, uh, things of that nature. That but there's a metric usually. Uh, we we do very few things that don't have some sort of tangible metric to it. Very very few people come and say, um, oh, just make us you know seem better. Like um, even. even I'm thinking of the Bellevue Financial, which uh, ended up becoming Trutina. One of the things that they said, the biggest difference for them was they understood what their story was and they could tell it to people. And, and they said, it, it, and it got away from them talking forever about themselves and talking about their clients. So they could say, you know, our whole perspective is on balance and boom, 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 and let's go. And, and so they came back and gave us positives. On EMI, one of the huge things was a, um, uh, a headhunter 
came and contacted them and just said, I have to tell you, I've never had people contact me and say, I want to work for this company because of their website, and it's happened three times because of yours. Um, so again, that's positive feedback that we, that we need when there isn't a metric involved. Um, but usually it's sales. Yeah? Um, wow, that's, do we have another talk? Um, the, the, the short answer is, is actually um, two things. One, if you're a number, you get to the top of the list, okay? And AAAAA Creative just somehow didn't quite have it. And it was a few years ago. Might work today. That might actually be kind of creative. And, but, but so putting a number in it um, was, was a way to get to the top of the list. Uh, there were five of us at the time. And um, we found that, again, it's, it's interesting that your eyes pretty much read five, even though there's a five in front of it. And I have to tell you, the other thing that's funny about it is a number of times I've gone to a bank or wherever, or I'm presenting a credit card at a restaurant or whatever, and they go, oh, five creative. Oh, that's creative. And they go, oh, you know. And so anyhow, um, but that, that, the, the alphabet was a big reason. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, um, if we're if we're just, you know, if you, if, I mean, it's almost like anything. If if we're working with a client who's, we'll say, is at a two, and we put an eight out there, they'll probably fail miserably. You can't go from a two to an eight. You just can't. It, there, there's too many variables in there in anything you're trying to do. You know, think about working out. I can run two miles a day. Okay, tomorrow do eight. Oh, you can't. You need to work up to it. So with whatever we're doing, we're trying to be real. We're trying to nail it, and then we're trying to make it aspirational so that they have some things to work towards. Um, so it's not just rolling out of bed and, yeah, I got this. Um, and, and, but it's always incremental. And, and often, we'll, we just did a client. We went back. Uh, Three or four years later, and we redid it again because they had gotten to that level, and they could now take on more, and they could do fuller branding with one of the with, with what their business was, and they could uh, affect more areas. So, but it absolutely should be aspirational. That anything? Wow, that was the best question. That answered everybody's. Okay, <laughs> David, back to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're great.